Good morning and welcome to our Faith to Faith broadcast. I'm Bishop Carl J. Van and thank you for welcoming us into your homes this morning. I pray that you are enjoying the blessings of the Lord for the word of God tells us the blessings of the Lord make it rich and he adds no sorrow to them. If you're not experiencing the blessings of the Lord, know this, that all is well at the end and if all is not well, it is not the end. God never ends on the negative. That means that if you're going through a trial or a test, the Lord is not finished, and when it's over, you'll come out and he'll get the glory. The battle is already won through what Jesus has done. We pray that this message will be a blessing to you. Now, enjoy. So the first thing this woman says in verse 15 is, Sir, give me this to drink that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. She doesn't get it immediately. He waits and cultivates the ground of her heart further so that she'll know what she's getting. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The third point is, the third of seven is he indicted her ways. Uh, the 16th through the 18th verse, they read, Jesus said unto her, go call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that says thou truly. He only confronts to bring transformation. He wasn't trying to put the woman down. Sometimes you got to rattle people to locate them, to to have them to locate themselves. Amen. And this is what Jesus does. Jesus told the woman to go call your husband and y'all come here. That's Virginia talk. <laughs> y'all come here. The Lord Jesus, who knows all things, knew that she wasn't married and that she had been married five times and that the man that she now was with wasn't her husband, he knew that. They're living together, but it's not a sanctified relationship. He, he knows that. So Jesus guides her to repent, to confess and repent of her sin. I told you recently about the woman who had not five, but four husbands. She first married a banker, but she divorced him. And then she married a movie star. She divorced him. After that, she married a preacher and divorced him. Lastly, she married a mortician and divorced him. And so a friend of hers asked her one day, child, why did you marry so many men of diverse backgrounds and careers. She said, well, I married one for the money, two for the show, three to get ready, and four to go. <laughs> I love telling that and doing this. Pastor Barbara first told me about it. So once this woman recognized Jesus, she humbly acknowledges her sinful past. I'm sure that with each relationship, this unnamed woman probably thought, this is the one. This is the one who's going to satisfy my thirst. This is the one who's going to bring me satisfaction and fulfillment. This is the one that's going to truly make me happy in life. But she divorced him. The second one, the same. The third, the same. The fourth, the same. The fifth, this got to be the one. She divorced him or he divorced her. Five of them have come and gone. So she's given up on the institution of marriage altogether. We're not making any excuses for her illegitimate relationship. We're just telling you where she was. Amen? So 
She just thought, I'll enjoy the fringe benefits of marriage by living in a conjugal relationship, but I won't be married. She meets Jesus, and she has an uh-oh moment. Uh-oh. She begins to realize, uh-oh, this is not an ordinary man. Uh-oh, this man is not going to hit on me. Uh-oh, I won't be able to seduce him if she was thinking that. Uh-oh, this is a holy man. Uh-oh, this is somebody special. This man is a prophet. How on earth can he know about me otherwise? I mean, he's not from here, and I've never met him before. How else can he know about me? except he be a holy prophet of God. So she concluded properly, but he was more than just the prophet. He's the son of God. She's going to discover that in a moment. Now, now why does Jesus put her in this awkward moment? Because there can be no worship without conversion. And there can be no conversion without conviction. You have to be saved to worship. Lost people can't worship. They can praise. Psalm 150 and 6 says, Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. The flowers praise him when they bloom. The trees praise him when they grow and develop leaves. The rooster praises him in the morning. Cuckoo, cuckoo. <laughs> the horses, everything that has breath, praise the Lord. People who aren't saved, praise the Lord. They come to church and they sing the songs, You Are My Strength, Strength Like No Other. Strength like no other reaches to me. They be singing those songs and not saved. They praising the Lord. So let everything that has breath praise the Lord. The Lord would have people who aren't saved that are praising him to be saved. But if they're not saved, they can praise the Lord. But everybody can't worship the Lord. Not the way God desires, because he desires people to worship him in spirit and in truth. And your spirit is not alive to God if you're not born again. And so you can't make any connection with him if you're not born again. Ephesians 2 and 1 says, and you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and, and sins, wherein times past ye also walked. According, they have it on the light vision screen. So, so we were once dead. That means that when we were lost, our spirits were dead. It was separated. It was cut off from God. We couldn't make any contact with God. We couldn't go in the Holy of Holies because our spirit man was dead. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And you're not in truth because you're not walking with the truth of God. We'll develop this even more on another point. On another point. All right, so the fourth point is she inquires about worship. In verses 19 and 20, the woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worship in this mountain. See, she brings up the subject of worship. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Mount Gerizim is the mountain that this unnamed woman is referring to here. Now, uh, the Samaritans, they had their own place of worship and their own twist on the Bible. They didn't receive the whole canon of the Old Testament. They only received the first five books of the Old Testament, the law of Moses. 
And then they even twisted that to fit their culture. You see, they were, again, remember, intermingled with Assyrians. And so the Assyrians brought some of their tradition also and mixed with the Jewish tradition. And so uh, Moses, according to the, the Jews and according to the Bible, the truth, Moses offered up Isaac on Mount Moriah, or which is also known as Mount Zion. But they say to, to twist it to their culture. Remember again, they are mixed with the Assyrians. Can I lay a foundation? They say that Abraham took Isaac up to Mount Gerizim, and that was their holy place of worship. Remember, uh, Moses in Deuteronomy, he dedicates two mountains and divides the 12 tribes into six, one a tribe of blessing and one of tri tribes of cursing. And so Mount, Mount, I should say one amount of blessing and one amount of cursing. So Mount Gerizim was a mount of blessing and Mount Ebal was the mount of cursing. And so the Samaritans held the tradition that uh, Mount Gerizim was their holy place. And this is where they built their place of worship. And this is where they worship. And this is why she said, our fathers worshiped in this mountain. And you say, yeah, in Jerusalem. Okay? Are you with me so far? This woman wanted the path of intimacy with God because she knew about these things. She was searching. So as this insightful conversation develops between Jesus and this Samaritan woman, she struggles with the penetrating issues raised by Jesus by hiding behind the barriers of places and programs. Many Christians have settled for cheap imitations of true worship. Jesus said, the Father seeketh such to worship him in spirit and in truth. But she was trying to make it about geography. Jesus said in spirit, but she wants to make it about geography or something physical. Worship is not physical. Worship primarily is spiritual. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mount Zion or Mount Gerizim, your temple or my temple, your church or my church, Jesus said geography is irrelevant. Some relegate worship to a particular event or building. Often worship is considered to be the music in a corporate service that is followed by the preaching. And an entire style of worship has been labeled, an entire style of music, I should say, has been labeled praise and worship in an attempt to distinguish music from traditional hymns. You know, you don't hardly sing amazing grace in praise and worship. It's usually something upbeat. So, while music is an integral part of worshiping God, we're not throwing that out. Uh, we should note that Jesus does not mention singing at all when he talks about worshiping God. Amen? He's not talking about singing at all. What's most important is that you worship in spirit and in truth. So what does it mean to worship in spirit and in truth? Now we're getting to the core of the message. What does it mean to worship in spirit and in truth? For worship to be authentic, it has to be two things. It has to be candid and it has to be credible. Hallelujah. It has to be candid and it has to be credible. It has to be candid and that it has to be real. It has to be from the heart. Yes. Hallelujah. It has to be honest. Amen. It's not fake. Amen. Most people, when they come to church, 
We're not just talking about New Life Worship Center. But most people, when they come to church, never enter into worship in spirit and in truth. Oh, Lord. Oh, yeah. I know I'm saying something now. Amen. Amen. So it can't be fake. It has to be from the spirit. And David was a worshiper. So he says in Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. That's worship in spirit. When you put your all in it, your core, the spirit man. You see, we're tripart beings. We're spirit, soul, and body. Worship is letting your spirit ascend to God. Touch God. Hallelujah. Uh, uh, it's not faith. It has to be from the spirit. Uh, not from the Holy Spirit, but from your spirit. If you'll no notice verse 24, verse 24, uh, I read the whole verse. It says, God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So the latter phrase, in spirit and in truth, that S is small case, meaning your spirit. This means your spirit. Your spirit has to touch God. Worship has to come from the core of you. It has to be authentic. This is why I say unsaved people can't worship because their spirits are dead. We just quoted Ephesians 2 and 1. So that's the idea of worshiping spirit in, in, uh, in spirit. Uh, so a person can worship on a physical level and on an emotional level and still not be worshiping the Lord in the spirit. Hallelujah. All of that is good when you worship him in spirit. It's okay to get emotional if, if you're in the spirit. But don't let the uh, emotionalism dictate to you that you're in the spirit. No, some time ago in my dumb days, in the early 70s, when I had backslidden from the Lord, I went to a Jackson 5 concert at the scope. And that guy said, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. And when he did that, did that move, and Jermaine doing like that, you know I had a four, everybody told him I looked like Jermaine during the time. When he hit that note, bumps came on me. Cheer bumps came on me. And the girl I was with was hollering. I said, you better shut up. <laughs> that was my dumb days. It wasn't past the ball. <laughs> Amen. That's... That's, that's emotion. So you don't have to be in the spirit to get emotional. You can get, get emotional at uh, Beyonce concert. That's right. That's right. Yes. Amen. Amen. So don't let emotionalism fool you. Don't let the chill bumps fool you. Uh, Jesus said, where did Isaiah prophesy of you? He said, ye hypocrites. These people honor me with their lips, with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching for tradition the commandments of men. So it has to be candid. That is, it has to be real. It has to be something you purpose in your own heart. And this, this is why uh, we don't want the worship leaders to be up here and say, come on, come on, come on, come on. Uh, I heard a, a DVD where a person even fussed them out. And I think curse. <laughs> no, let's not go that far. We can encourage people to worship, but, but we're not going to pu keep pulling you and straining you because if you got it, you got it, and if you don't, you don't. Hallelujah. Everybody is not in a position to worship God. Amen. 
Glory to God. And so it has to not only be candid, but it also has to be credible. That is, it has to be in truth. We, real worship is more than sincerity or being earnest. How many times have you heard people say, well, they, they are so sincere? This woman was sincere probably in her worship at these different places, at a different temple with a different worship system. But she, she was worshiping sincerely, but she was sincerely wrong. It has to be based on truth, on knowledge. Verse 22 says, ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. So it has to be in truth. He says, you know not, so you're not worshiping in truth. You got to know to worship in truth. You got to know that God lives, that Jesus was born of a virgin, that he suffered, bled, and died, and gave his life for the sins of mankind, but that he was buried and rose again from the dead. That's who you got to know who you're worshiping. Hallelujah. That's in truth because Jesus and Jesus only is the truth. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You've got to worship in spirit and in truth or in Jesus. Hallelujah. In the knowledge of Jesus. Without this, you can have all kinds of sincere thoughts about wrong things. Uh, the fifth point, he, he instructs her on worshiping. Look at John 21 and 24. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. It's not about where you worship. It's about whom you worship. Do you hear me? People make pilgrimages to Rome People make pilgrimages to Mecca. And some people even make pilgrimages to Jerusalem uh, to, to get in a certain holy place and worship God. Well, you don't have to go to those places. And there's nothing wrong with going to those places if you want to tour them. But you don't have to go there uh, to, to find God. That's why Jesus says it's expedient for you that I go away so that the Holy Spirit, uh, Jesus wouldn't just be found in Jerusalem, but everywhere. Oh, glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. And, and they think that if I can get to that geographical place and touch that relic, God will be near. He can be near right here in Norfolk, Virginia. The essence of true worship is not external, but internal. Internal. Internal, saints. Yet we're so prone to identify worship with externals, like how nice or shabby the building is, or how many is in attendance, or, or how good the music is, or, or how gifted the preacher is, uh, whether someone near us is doing something on their smartphone other than, uh, than, than reading a Bible app or taking notes. Uh, we come here uh, uh, as the audience. When we shouldn't be the audience, God should uh, uh, be the audience. We should be the participants. Hallelujah. Do you hear me, saints? We should be the participants. Get in the audience of God. Mm. Some of you can't worship unless you're sitting in your seat. Uh, excuse me, this is my seat. <laughs> Come on. I can only feel God here. <laughs> oh, okay, I, I'll leave that alone. I leave that alone. What's the difference between praise and worship? Because they're not the same. We speak of them together, but there's a difference between praise and worship. It's like salt and pepper. 
Praise brings the presence of God, and worship is our encounter of communion with the Lord in that presence. Praise brings, brings the presence of God, but worship is entering into that presence and going into the holy of holies. Worship is an encounter in the presence of the Lord filled with energy, excitement, and exuberance. Some of you remember Star Trek. Well, on Star Trek, they would be in one place and they needed to be to another place. So they would just get on the spot. And once they got on the spot, uh, Captain Kirk uh, would say, or somebody else would say, hit the button. Beam me up, Scotty. Beam me up, Scotty. Immediately, they'd be, they'll be translated and show up in another dimension. What was in that movie, that's what worship is in your life. When you worship God, you're saying, beam me up, Lord. And he beams you up. And he carries you to another dimension. He places you in another realm. He carries you in another stratosphere. Hallelujah. When you worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, no prison can hold you. That's why the Bible tells us that at midnight, when Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, the doors of the prison were open and everybody's shackles were loose because when you get in praise and worship, no prison can hold you. Depression can't stay on you. Anxiety can't ride you. Glory to God. When you praise the Lord in spirit and in truth, he gives you the garment of praise instead of the spirit of heaviness. There is no way that you can worship God and be depressed. Thank you for watching our Faith to Faith broadcast. We pray that this message really ministered to you. Pastor Barbara, New Life Worship Center, and I would just love to have you to be a part of one of our services. We have two morning worship services on Sunday mornings at 8 and 11, and then we have a midweek service on Wednesday nights at 7.30. In fact, you still have time to meet us at our 8 o'clock service. When you come at the end of the service, if it's not an imposition, just come on up and let Pastor Barbara and I know that you were a part of our service. We would just love to have you and share with you how glad we are that you are with us on today. So until next time, come receive the word, leave and experience the difference at New Life.